I told her about taxes, because uh, I'm definitely going to need her, because I need to be, I need to get a million dollars in return for my taxes every year, <laughs> in order for me to make it. <laughs> but since moving from the taxes now, we're going to put it in action. Like He says, when you give up your excuses, you will find results. So without further ado, this young man is coming here to let us know about all the excuses. Give them up. Let's, let's learn today. So without further ado, let's give it up for Tim Capsule. Yes, Tim. All right, I said first. All right, folks. So first of all, we do things at Action Coach a little differently. So um, I'm going to have you all stand up. All right, hands in the air, big stretch. Push yeah. your right. left. So, um, how is it that we all learn how to walk? Mm -hmm. 
trial and error, falling down? Yes, no? yeah, we made mistakes, right? But what was different, or, or what was around us? Why was it that we were able to learn how to walk? Parents. Yeah, we had love and encouragement and support, and every time we fall, somebody was talking and cheering, and, right? and all we knew as a kid is that's exactly what we were supposed to do, so we kept doing it until eventually we figured out how to walk. What happens when we become adults? That train goes away. Yes. <laughs> and, and for some reason, making mistakes is, is frowned upon, right? Mm -hmm. It's something that, uh, that we're discouraged to do, and so we're supposed to, for whatever reason, hide the fact that we're, we're making mistakes. Well, I'm here to tell you I work with hundreds of business owners, right? and our franchise works with hundreds of thousands of business owners. Everybody makes mistakes, right? And so if, you, if you're willing to put yourself out there today, and, and you know, make some mistakes and, and learn and grow with me, then you're going to benefit significantly from today's program. So the only failure then in our business and failure in life is what? Call this out for me. Participate. Yeah, the failure to participate. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing. We know from statistics that if you just simply sit and listen to what I have to share with you today, you'll retain about 5%. Mm -hmm. If you take notes, that retention will go up to about 50%. So that's why I handed out the, uh, the paper so everyone can take notes. If you fully participate in the learning experience, so you know when I ask you to play my silly game of you know clapping your hands and, and saying people are awesome, and when I ask you questions, you shout out the answer. Right? If, you, if you fully engage in today's learning experience, that retention goes up to about 98%. So a show of hands, is everyone going to participate fully today? Yep. Yes. Awesome, yep. fantastic. So you'll get out of this experience what you put into it. Amen. If you put in 100%, you'll get out of 100%. Mm -hmm. There's two steps to this educational opportunity. Step one is this seminar that you're learning today. So I'm going to go over at a, uh, a high level of all the best practices of how great companies are run. You're going to get a number of ideas and things that you can apply in your business right away. And then step two is a deep dive one-on-one -on -one with, with just you and I, or your business partners and I, where we're going to then apply this knowledge specifically to your business. And that second step is complementary. Because what I want to make sure, like I said earlier, is that you have the opportunity to understand, yeah, how does this theory and what I learned today specifically apply to my business? And so I'm going to be asking you at the end to take advantage of that second step. So a little bit about me. Uh, born and raised in Canada, I share that because you're gonna hear words that I pronounce that you think sound funny. I guarantee that in my head they sound the same as you all will say them. Uh, <laughs> um, moved to the US in 2005 with the word transfer. Spent the last 28 years uh, running businesses in the corporate world and managing people. Run businesses that you probably all know very well, like Raid and Loft and Ziploc and Saran Lap and Engine Skins Mitchell, Gel, Pledge, Fantastic, Scrubby Bubbles, Sargento Cheese, and what brought me here locally was Red Bull Tomatoes. Um, those businesses ranged anywhere from a million and a half in revenue to over 500 million, and I coached, mentored, and trained well over 200 people. In that time, folks have gone on to be vice presidents, presidents, and even a CEO, both here and in Canada. And through all of that, you know, the, the most rewarding thing has been is seeing people that I've invested into to become better versions of themselves and to go grow beyond even what they thought was their potential. So why do I do what I do? So growing up, I didn't have a lot of money. Um, now, I didn't have to drink dirty water. <laughs> and, and it we, we had a little bit more money. We grew up in the country, so we had a well. So it wasn't quite that bad. But, but I didn't know we didn't have a lot of money until I got to school and people started teasing me. And I, I didn't have the, 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 the Nike shoes. I didn't have the, you know, the Bible One jeans. And so that left a, a scar and uh, it had a, had a big impact on me. And so much so that I became a peer counselor in high school. I was a lay counselor in church in Milwaukee. Um, I moved into the inner city in Milwaukee uh, and was a big brother for about eight years. I was the only white person in, in this neighborhood. None of my friends would come and visit me. I had to go and visit them because they were afraid of. Uh, so coming from Canada, when I moved to Milwaukee, one of the most segregated um, cities in America, I just didn't get it. 
because that's not how I grew up. So that was, I just felt compelled to do my tiny little thing to, to make a difference there. So how does that now apply to what I do today is our vision is to be able to help 10,000 underserved people in the next 10 years through the profits of our company. And how we're going to do that is by working with 3,000 business owners, helping them grow and, and develop and build their business, and then through the revenue that they pay us, we then can, can put that profit into helping the community. Mm -hmm. So a little bit about Action Coach. So Action Coach is a franchise. I'm a franchise owner, so what that means is I bought the rights um, or, or um, bought the permission from that the franchise to be able to operate as a franchise owner here. They're a locally owned company, um, and that resonated with me because I've spent my whole career working for family-owned and privately-owned companies, and uh, I had a short experience at a public company and had a complete culture shock, so I really appreciated the fact that this was a family-owned company. Our vision as a, as a franchise is world abundance through business re-education. So what does that mean? The school system teaches us how to be employees. Mm -hmm. It doesn't prepare us for and teach us how to be business owners. Okay? So for those of us who have decided to step out and, and run our own business, there's this completely overwhelming realization of I don't know most of the things that I'm supposed to know as a business owner. So we know that when we take the time to re-educate ourselves on how to be a great business owner, the sky's the limit. So that's where that world abundance idea comes in because most small business owners aren't great at running their business. They're great at their thing, right? Their art or their craft or their trade. So if we take the time to learn how to be a great business owner, we will be significantly more successful than our competitors. And then finally, we coach about 18,000 businesses one-on-one -on -one around the world a week, and we've got hundreds of thousands of clients that we uh, coach in group sessions around the world. We are the, the number one coaching firm. We have a number of accolades uh, to, to back that up. And then equally importantly is we've got about a thousand of us, a thousand of me, in 80 countries around the world. So why does that matter? It, why it matters to me is that if I'm working with a client who has a particular challenge or struggle that I don't have experience with, I can reach out to my network and say, hey, has anybody ever worked with this type of industry, with this type of challenge, and what was the strategy that you guys used to, to address that problem? And now I've got that network of, of knowledge and expertise that I can leverage with my clients. Right, so I want to share a, a, just a quick little video here of um, some testimonials from some of the clients that I've been working with. Two years in a row, we had about the same revenue. So we were really growing. We would lose a few, gain a few, not really growing. And so I had to decide, okay, do I want to do it the way it is? Or do I want to grow it enough so that I don't have to clean so much and I can spend more time with grandkids? So guess which one I picked? <laughs> it's amazing how much you don't really know now. And I think a business, I think, I think if you're struggling, if you're struggling in business or you're looking to pivot and grow, I think as individuals, as business owners, we don't so far, it's really, it's really great to have really great to have and it's almost like an additional partner. I mean we're still responsible for doing the work, but it's really great to have that that other person there to sell you on, to give advice, to give feedback, to challenge you. Um, so yeah, I, I would say to other business owners, if you hit a wall, if you think capacity, you're struggling, you're like, I don't understand, I've worked so hard, I have a great team, we should be, we deserve more. It might be that you're just missing something you can't see. And so we kind of got to a point where it was getting too messy, things were happening too fast, and it didn't matter how hard I worked, I was not going to be able to fix things every day. And so that's when I kind of came through in the towel and said, okay, it's over my head. It's time to call in help. So for me, Tim was the, the, the idea of having a coach was going to be not only to help me learn what I didn't even know I needed to learn, because I knew there had to be plenty of that out there. But it was about pulling in some chaos control. All right, so I want to start with having you guys uh, write down on your piece of paper what your number one learning goal is for this session. Is there a certain challenge you're facing in your business? Is there an opportunity in your business? Is there something that you would love to be able to walk away with that knowledge of when you leave today's session? Good. Sorry? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. 
give one for you. All right, so you, you might all be wondering why am I taking this you know, long pause to have you do that. It's because what you just did by writing down your goal is you triggered what's called your reticular activating system, or your RAS for short. Sure. How many of you guys have bought a car um, or, or got a, a car donated to you from you know, the, your, your friend who <laughs> said it's the one we're not using in fact? And, as you're driving it over the next couple of weeks, you start to notice that, hey, there's that car, hey, there's that car, there's that car. Have you guys had that experience? Uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. So it's not really that everybody went and bought the same car that you did at the same time you did. What happened is that act of buying it, you told your particular activity system or your subconscious that this thing is important to you. And now it's constantly working, going, oh, that thing you said is important to you, there it is, there it is, there it is. After two or three weeks, you stop noticing your car, right? Mm -hmm. Because the same thing is your subconscious knows that it's no longer important to you. So why is that important? Well, have you guys had a, a time where you couldn't think of a uh, solve a problem or you couldn't fix a challenge and then after a good night's sleep the answer just seems to come to you in the morning? Mm -hmm. Has that ever happened to you guys? Mm -hmm. That's your subconscious, right? Yeah. About 90 some percent of your brain is your subconscious and it's just constantly turning and working on whatever it is that you told it that it should be working on. So by writing down your goal today, you told your subconscious to be listening to everything I share to answer the, the thing that you just wrote down on your paper. So your brain is your, it's your compass for your brain in terms of where it should focus. So how does this apply to business? You should have business goals, right? Annual goals, monthly goals, quarterly goals, weekly goals, daily goals, every morning, you should get up and look at your goals of what do I want to accomplish today so that your reticular activating system can be working on it. Before you leave the office every day, you should write out what do I want to accomplish tomorrow so that your subconscious can be thinking about that while you're sleeping. Have you ever um, found yourself saying when something didn't go the way that you wanted it to, well, next time I'll try harder? Or the phrase, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again? Anyway? found himself saying that? Okay, so here's the problem with that. It's actually a subconscious cop -out. We're actually giving ourselves permission to not do it because what we're saying will try harder. You can't try, right? Try's, trying's not an action. You do something or you don't do something, you're going to do that, right? You can't try. And so if you find yourself saying that, trying, it's, again, it's you're giving yourself an out. You're giving yourself a subtle excuse to not work hard on the thing that you already know that you should be doing. So we call this idea doing or not doing the point of power. Okay? And you're either above or below the point of power. So folks who are below the point of power, they find themselves in this proverbial bed of life. So I want you to call out the first one here for me. What do people do below the point of power? Blame. Yeah, they blame. And who do they blame? Anyone they can. Right? Their boss, their colleague, their mother-in-law. The government, God, whatever, right? Anything that they can do to take it uh, off of themselves. Mm -hmm. So do me this favor. Point at me as if you're blaming me for something that went wrong in your business. Mm -hmm. And keep your hands up in the air. Now, how many fingers are pointing back at yourself? 
Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's easy to, to put the blame on someone else, but we can't control what other people do, right? Mm -hmm. All we can do is control ourselves. So life is a mirror. If there's things that we don't like that are in our life, then we always have to reflect back on what am I doing to attract that? The, the law of attraction, right, is that whatever the energy is that we put out, that's what we receive. So if there's stuff, if we don't like the finances of our business, if we don't like the relationships that we have, if we don't like the car that we drive, whatever that is, right, we've got to reflect on it. What can I do differently to get a different outcome? Um, excuses. How many know teenagers who are experts at making excuses? Show of hands. All right, again, who do you think they learned that from? So again, we want to be looking at ourselves and say, hey, what can I be doing differently? And then denial, if you have employees who are constant deniers in your business, you gotta get rid of them because they're toxic, they're gonna to spread that virus throughout the organization and it's not gonna be good for anyone. Right? Conversely, those who are above the point of power, they take their aura of life, right? And they, they take ownership, accountability, and responsibility for whatever situation they find themselves in because they know that they're the only ones that are going to be able to get themselves out of that situation. So COVID is a, is a great example of this. When, when COVID first happened and the, you know, the world started shutting down, people, a lot of business owners stuck their head in the sand. And they said, hey, I'm just going to wait this out for a couple weeks. Right? Unfortunately, a couple weeks turned into a couple years, and a lot of businesses didn't survive. There are, uh, there are stories also, though, of businesses who took ownership, accountability, responsibility, survived through COVID, and actually came out significantly stronger than how they went in because they looked at that situation and said, I can't be a victim. I, I can't be powerless in this situation. I'm going to have to pivot and figure out a way to, to make things work and, and have this business survive through this pandemic. So daily, we have the option, we have the choice. We can choose to be powerless or we can choose to be powerful. Mm -hmm. It's our own choice. So can I get a show of hands? Everyone gonna choose to be powerful? Mm -hmm. All right, fantastic. So here's the thing. Even when we consciously choose to be powerful, it doesn't mean that life's not gonna happen, right? We're still gonna get those proverbial punches in the stomach where we lose a customer, or a prospect that we thought was gonna say yes, you know, ends up not saying yes, and, and we get beat up, and, and we're gonna fall below the point of power. It's just a natural human reaction, but the key is to know that that's what happened, mm -hmm. right? And to be able to recognize that we're down here and then do the next right thing and pull ourselves back up. So, a few years ago, um, when I was still in the corporate world, I was in a meeting, there were a couple of the owners of the company and some of the VPs in this meeting, and one of the VPs said something that, that really hurt me. So bad that I excused myself from the meeting, I went to my office, I packed up all my stuff, and I got everything into the car and started driving home. Wow. And as I was driving home, I'm like, hmm, I wonder how, I, it's kind of like the story, I wonder how I'm gonna explain this to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I went back to the office and it wasn't very long, so fortunately, they didn't get fine. I walked back into the meeting with my tail between my legs, excused myself for stuffing out, they thought I just went to the restroom, and, and I got to keep my job. I share that because my life happens, right? There's some stuff that happens, and it's important to be able to rebound from it and rebound from it quickly. That's the truth. Um, and sometimes we may not be able to see in ourselves that we're down here. So we may have to have others in our life that can point it out for us. Mm -hmm. And I'm incredibly blessed because my wife has no problem at all at telling me when I'm down here. I, and she also tell me, she'll be like, Tim, you're, 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 you know, that's a terrible attitude. You gotta fix that. <laughs> and so that's my, that's my helper in terms of uh -huh. what I'm doing with my power. Praise God. All right, a little bit about learning. So how many, and let's go back to the teenage example. How many of you have um, experience with teenagers where there's something that they consistently forget to do and you remind them of it and the first thing they say is, I know. Anyone have that happen? My stepson does it all the time. I'm like, well, if you know, <laughs> then why didn't you just do it? Right? Here's the problem with I know. As soon as we say I know, 
we tell our subconscious that this conversation is not valuable. Mm. And so it goes and starts working on all those other things that you have on its list of up to do's. And you may know 80% of the conversation. In fact, you may, may all be sitting here right now saying, Tim, I already know all this stuff. When are you going to get to the valuable part? Right? But the point is, if we don't stay engaged in that conversation, we end up missing the nuggets. There, there could be the answer to our problem in that conversation if we don't shut off the conversation and we listen and we, and we go through and, and wait for those nuggets to appear. So instead of I know, I want you all to be thinking about keeping an open mind to the possibility of learning and change that to something like, isn't that interesting? Can I get the commitment that you all take that approach, keep an open mind to learning? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. All right. There's been a lot of talk already today about, you know, sometimes business is hard, right? Long hours, it's rough, there's stuff that doesn't happen the way we want it to. It takes a long time in the beginning to get to the point where we're actually making money. And, and so it can at times be a thankless job. And so we want to make sure that as we're learning how to build a business, because just like learning how to walk, we're all learning how to build our business, right? And that means we're gonna stumble, and we're gonna fall, and we're gonna trip, and we're gonna bounce up and down, and, right? and, and, and eventually we'll figure it out, but we're not gonna get it the first time. So, like our parents did for us by encouraging us and motivating us and cheering us, they made it, they made it what? Call this out for me, what happened? You will end up what? Fun. Yes. They made it fun for us to learn how to walk. We've gotta make sure that we're making it fun for us to learn how to, to grow and develop our business. So what might that look like? I'll, the mistake a lot of business owners make is they save it up. Well, we'll celebrate at the end of the quarter if we make our numbers, or at the end of six months, or at the end of the year. But what happens if you don't make the numbers? Does that mean you can't have fun? Mm -hmm. So instead, let's think about what can we do on a daily basis, and a weekly basis, to make the experience fun. I have one client who has a, a, a celebration ballot. Right? So anytime anybody has a win in the building, they get, they get to go over and ring the bell. I encourage all my clients to have a dry erase board that's it, it's a win board, where everybody throughout the week just shares their wins. And then in your team meetings, you go around the room and you ask everyone to share the wins of what happened the week before. Make it something that's more ongoing because then you create that positive momentum. Right? As you're sharing wins, it feels a whole lot better than losing, right? And now other people are wanting to share their wins, and then it becomes a snowball effect of fun. You also want to think about how to uh, how to have fun outside of work. Right? So with, um, Laura talked about the idea, right? You got to shut it off at some point in time, right? Shut off the business day and go into your personal day. So Friday nights for us are are movie and pizza nights. And that's just a fun tradition that we do to say, okay, the, the work week is done and we're now in the new week. Mm -hmm. So think about for your own business and personal life, how can you make sure that you're having fun during this journey? So let's think about businesses. There's, there's really two types of businesses. Okay? The first is where the business is controlling you or running you. Okay? This type of business is where the business owner is working 60, 70, 80 hours a week. Right? Nobody can do the job as well as you. Every decision has to be filtered through you. Um, the, what Laura said earlier, you might be a micromanager, right? Where nobody can, can, you can't let go of control. There's no thing, such thing as leaving early to go to a school function or a four day weekend or, or two weeks of vacation. The other kind of business is where you're driving the business. So in this environment, you have the systems and the people in place to run the business for you. People are empowered to make decisions on their own within a safety net of not being able to, to make too big of mistakes. In this situation, customers are dealing directly with your employees, not you, and you've empowered them and trained them and set them up for success so they, they can run the day-to-day -day operations for you. In this example, it's no problem at all to go away for two weeks of vacation and know with 100% confidence that the business will be able to run without you and you won't, be able, you won't have to be disturbed while you're on vacation. So how many folks know people who used to have a business and ended up going back to become an employee? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the statistics are huge. 80% right? of businesses fail. 
And the main reason for that is burnout. Because here's what happens. In the first couple years of starting a business, we all have to do the hustle and grind. Okay? We have to put in those 60, 70, 80 hours a week to get it figured out and get it working and, and get, it, get the momentum and get it building. However, if we continue to spend that much time working in the business, we get tired, we get frustrated, we get discouraged, and eventually you know, we, can, we can get to burn it. So, um, how, do we, how do we overcome that? Well, here's the reality. Most small business owners have just simply bought themselves a job. Mm -hmm. wow. And we're trading our time for money. So if we're sick and we can't go to our, our business, then we don't get paid, and now our livelihood is, is at risk. God forbid, if something was to happen to us and we couldn't go to work for three to six months, right? So I, my dad was a mechanic growing up, and he screwed up his shoulder, had to have surgery, the surgery didn't take, didn't fix it. This was right before I was going off to college. My parents had said that they were gonna pay for college, and then this happened to dad. All of a sudden, parents couldn't pay for college because dad couldn't work. There are a lot of business owners that are in that predicament, that if, if something happened to them, the business couldn't continue to operate without them. And so we call this idea of, of climbing up the entrepreneurial ladder. So we all start as employees, right? And for those of us who have decided to go out on our own, we become self-employed. Right? And I talked earlier that the school system doesn't teach us how to be employees, or sorry, doesn't teach us how to, to run a business, so it teaches us how to be employees. So there's a significant learning curve at that step. And that's where a lot of businesses get that burnout because they're, they're, they're churning in not learning how to run a business. The ideal is to climb up the ladder, which is you know, hire people, become a manager, have other folks be able to do some of the, the you know, take some of the burden off of us, do some of the day to day operations. Our goal at Action Coach is to help businesses become what we call a true business owner. And a true business owner is where the business can run without us. Mm -hmm. When we get to that level, we now have the freedom and flexibility to think about what's next. So now we have this successful business that's running that has passive income. And like Laura was saying, we now can invest in other businesses, right? We can start other businesses or we can invest in, the, in real estate or the stock market because we've got this, the, the cash flow from this business to be able to give us those options. And then ultimately, we want to become an entrepreneur where other people are investing in our business. So why do we stay stuck? It was mentioned earlier today, but the, the reason for most of us is we prefer our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And we want that safety net, and this is what I've always known, this is what I've always done, and I just, I just want to be confident in what I'm doing. If that's the case, then we, those people should stay as employees, because everything that we want in our business and everything that we want in life is on the other side of our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So if we're not willing to step into that, then we're going to stay stuck. So that's why most small business owners stay self-employed because they've created that safety bubble of, well, I know how to do my thing with just me and trade my time for money and I don't know how to hire employees, I don't know how to manage employees, I don't know how to let go, or I don't know how to coach and mentor and train other people to do it. And so they end up staying there and then leads to that burden that I was talking about earlier. So at Action Coach, we define a business as quite differently than others. So a successful business to us is a commercial profitable enterprise that can work without you. So I'm gonna go through this in, in a little bit more detail now using our six steps framework to explain what I mean by this. So um, the six steps I'm gonna walk through, I'm gonna have you call each of these ones out for me. So what's step one? Mastery. Yes, mastery. So how do you know if you're a master of something? It's because other people come to you and ask you to teach them how to do it. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing, do you think most small business owners are masters of running their business? Nope. No. They're a master at accounting or payroll or stand-up comedy or right or or or. 
And so the, the goal here is to take the time to learn how to, to be a great business owner. Um, this is all about eliminating the day-to-day -day chaos that we experience in the business. Step two, what is that one? Niche. Yeah, niche or niche, however you pronounce it. This is all about creating a predictable cash flow. Growing the business, getting, getting profit in the business, getting a revolving cash flow so that we can have the cash to invest back into the business. Okay. Step three, what is that one? Leverage. leverage. Yes, leverage. Oh, leverage. So leverage is all about systems and processes and procedures to make the business run more efficiently and effectively. Step four, what is that one? Team. Yes. So this is all about ensuring we've got the right people on the bus, they're sitting in the right seat on the bus, and we've set them up for success. And this allows us to be prepared for growth. Because when we have the people in place that can take on additional customers or additional clients, right, we're then able to scale. Step five is then synergy. So at this point, we've got a well-oiled machine that can run without us. And so now we can pull out of the day-to-day -day and start to think about what's next. Right? Maybe we want to open a, another location. Maybe we want to start another business. Right? Maybe we want to hot, retire and sell this business. We've got the ability to do that. No investor wants to buy a business that you're the only reason it works. Yep. And so if that's the case, most small business owners never sell their business because of that. It just The business just dies when they retire. If the business can run without us, we now have this cash flow machine that investors are willing to buy into. So we have a president in place or a general manager right, that has replaced us so that now we've got an asset to be able to sell. And then ultimately, step six is results. That's the, what do we want out of life and what does this business have to provide in order for us to have the things that we want out of life. So these are the six steps to uh, massive results. But do you think that this is something that's easy? No. 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 It takes massive action in order to get these massive results. So somebody said earlier, this is not for the faint of heart. Right? It. It's a lot of hard work to, to be able to build a successful business like this. But the good news is, is that there's a framework and a process and a methodology that I'm walking you through today in terms of what are the best practices of building these great businesses. So let me step back and I'm going to go through each of these steps in just a little bit more detail. Okay. So mastery. Going back to my definition of a commercial profitable enterprise that runs without you, mastery is all about building just simply a commercial enterprise. What do I mean by that? So think of building a high rise. Okay. You don't have solid footings and a foundation in place and you go to scale the building, what's going to happen? Yeah, the building's going to topple over. Right? So same thing with our business. If we don't have a solid foundation in our business and we start to scale it, it's also going to topple over. Or at, it, or at least there's going to be a ton of chaos that we're having to deal with every day. So there's four areas of mastery that you want to focus on implementing into your business. The first is destination mastery. So this is Stephen Covey's idea of begin with the end in mind. Okay? So what does my business look like when it's done? and be very specific. What year is it done? What's the revenue? What's the profit? What's the organization chart look like? And am I selling it or passing it down to the next generation? And if I'm selling it, how much am I selling it for? Think about that particular activating system that I was talking about earlier and setting our subconscious. Having a very specific goal now gives our subconscious something to be working at over the next 10, 20, 30 years, whatever that happens to be. Then work backwards from that. What does that look like in three years from now, in one year from now, next quarter, this month, this week, today? And be tracking ourselves of are we doing the things that are required to be able to get that long term plan? I have a client who, when we first started working together uh, a couple years ago, said, Tim, I, I want my business to be a million dollars in five years, and I want to then pass it down to my daughter to run for But that, she didn't have any more detail. Than that. So we, we developed a one, two, three year plan. We put together a 90 day plan in terms of what specifically does she need to be working on to, to progress to that. We're two years into our working relationship. She's over delivering her two year goal. Her daughter now has started coaching as well so that she can learn and grow into being able to take over the business for mom. Um, mom went on vacation uh, a couple months ago 
for the first time in, I think she said 12 years, mm -hmm. that she was able to go on a, a one week vacation and not worry about the business. Money mastery. So, um, have you, any of you guys watched the show The Profit? So, Mark, Marcus's quote on there is if you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. I say. Right, Lori, you'll appreciate mm -hmm. that. I'm sure that you deal with that all the time, right? And so the idea here is we've got to have a good, solid, foundational understanding of, of our numbers. Right? We've got to be able to make good business decisions based on the financial health of our business. So things like looking at our p and monthly, profit and loss statement monthly, looking at our balance sheet monthly, having cash flow projections that go out you know, six to 12 weeks depending on when our, our business cycle is, and looking at those on a weekly basis, having a profit margin targeted and knowing what our current profit margins are, and having all this in some type of financial dashboard that we're reviewing on a regular basis. So one of my clients first started working together, um, I laughed when we were talking about the receipts earlier because she literally did that, took it to her CPA, and prayed that she was profitable. Now, praying is a very powerful strategy, but not necessarily in this case. Right. Much better that, to be tracking your numbers. So now, on a monthly basis, we review her numbers together, and just simply by her looking at the numbers, she's made improvements in her profit because she's like, oh, I didn't realize X, right? We don't need to be spending that money anymore. Mm -hmm. Time mastery. So the thing about time mastery is, first of all, we've got to know the difference between working on the business activities and working in the business activities. And then strategically, we have to align our weekly calendar to how much time am I going to spend in each of those areas. And we use a tool like a default diary to block our calendar to say, this is what I'm going to do when. So we don't let the business control us. We control the business and we control our time. Then we want to make sure over time that we're checking in on ourselves. Am I actually following the time plan? Or has the business taken you know, time away from me. So we do time studies on a regular basis. I have a client who, after she did her time study, she said to me, Tim, I'm actually embarrassed to share this with you, but I realized through my time study that I spend about seven hours a week on my cell phone. She would go to her cell phone for something business related, but then get distracted by social media or personal emails. And so now she leaves her cell phone upside down, out of arm's reach, and she has seven extra hours a week to work on the business. And then finally, delivering mastery. Here we want to make sure that we're consistently meeting and meeting our clients' expectations. When I share this one, most people will say to me, well, Tim, of course I'm, I'm meeting my clients' expectations because they're still with me. Well, that's actually a false system. Because mildly, dissatisfied customers or mildly dissatisfied customers aren't going to leave you until they found somebody else to replace you with. And they're not going to tell you that they're dissatisfied. They're just going to tell you that they fired you. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is be asking them for feedback right? on a regular basis, asking where are the areas that I'm doing well versus where are the areas that I can improve. So that's why you all have a feedback form. Because I would appreciate at the end of today that you guys give me feedback on you know, what did you like, what can I make better for next time, so that each time I share this presentation, I'm elevating my game and making it a better experience for others. So look at how you can incorporate that into your business. All right, step two, niche a commercial profitable enterprise. Okay? So why is it profitable? The reason that it's profitable now is because we aren't competing on us. The minute that the only reason that your business exists is because you're the best price, you set yourself up for bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. Because somebody is always going to be willing to undercut you, and now it becomes this death spiral to the bottom. There's an analogy or a value proposition uh, analogy called the three-legged stool, or the three-legged value proposition. It's price, quality, and speed. You can provide two of the three, but you can never provide all three. So you want to think about how are you differentiating yourself in the marketplace. If the only differentiation you have is the best price, you're going to want to rethink that so that you're setting yourself up to have a sustainable business model. So how do we do that? First of all, it's by having creating a unique selling proposition. Right? What do I mean by that? Think about what is it about your business 
that is uniquely different from your competitors that allows you to charge the price that you need to have a sustainable business model. So earlier I told you a, a number of things about Action Coach, right? We're the, the number one uh, coaching company in the world. We've been around for 28 years. We've got a thousand of us in 80 countries around the world. So those are all things that 